Thing. I hope you all had a decent week. If not, I hope this weekend is better for you. Welcome to a new episode of the Bonnet Chronicles. This one is called Drifters and Gatekeepers Get Me a Headache. And we have a lot to talk about tonight, y'all. It has been a crazy week. Of course, our government is in the middle of the gun shutdown because the GOP is full of shit and they rather push a stimulus package that protects people who endangered their workers by sending them into COVID factories and into stores without protection and not giving the American people the means to pay our rent, pay our bills. It is going to be a rough winter. I've been saying this since Cracker November Barrel, we're cooking up. since, what the heck was that? I think one of the article sites I had decided to play an ad. That was weird. But, yeah, to go back on my GOP rent, I said it in a video before, hey, sweetie, um, and I mean it, that the Republicans are doing everything they can to halt actually giving people the money that they need to provide economic stability while we deal with COVID. And I can't speculate to the reason why besides them just being evil and greedy. They only care to ingratiate themselves. And they don't care if people are suffering or struggling or wondering what they're going to do when unemployment benefits run out or what they're going to do to pay rent or bills at the end of the month. They don't care that Christmas is coming and a lot of families are facing eviction or whether to give up even having a meal or give gifts this year because we had the COVIDian in chief too busy ingratiating himself and his kids to take care of this country. And that's why his ass got voted out. But we won't have a new administration until January. And I would have thought that to save his sorry ass and to maybe bolster his Senate chances for holding power, that Mitch McConnell would have been smarter. The GOP are not smart men. And that's the biggest con that they pulled on our country, was trying to convince people that they were educated policy wonks. The only things that these men ever push are pay raises and safety nets for themselves and their friends. And we have seen that this year. And we see it as other countries give um, their citizens comprehensive stimulus packages up to seven grand in places like Germany a month for families where we got one stimulus check for $1,200 36 weeks ago. And people, like I said, are being evicted. They're not even sure if they're going to be able to celebrate the holidays. Nevertheless, know if they're going to have a place to live. And it's all because of this... What? What is that? Okay, sweetie. Oh, boy. No, that's the wrong one, though. I think that'll help. Either way, um, God, I was trade of thought. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad he's helping now. Why am I getting breaking news on my phone all of a sudden? Ah, the things I do to do research are backfiring on me tonight. I'm a bit tired, but I'm going to power through it. Also, I'm going to announce that the next Bonnet of Chronicles won't be next Friday because it's Christmas. Duh. It'll be on the Saturday. And the New Year's uh, New Year Bonnet Chronicle will be on the Saturday after. But then I'm going back to Friday nights because Fridays are more comfortable for me. Saturday nights are normally the nights I use to unwind, spend time with Axiom. So cut it out. I'm not going to stream on Christmas Day or Christmas night. That's crazy. And I'm not going to stream on New Year's night. So I will do them the Saturday after for the next two weeks, you know, to update y'all on what's going on. Um, hopefully the Bionic Chronicles will continue to be a weekly thing. I have no plans on stopping that. But I made some other personal choices in my life that were not easy, but I realized they were necessary. One of them was I decided that my Anchor FM podcast, The Social Wear Nightmare, would go on once a month. I did the end of the year cast for that. It wasn't that great, but I just wanted to update people on what was going on for that. Also, I will 
be leaving Snatching Edges. And that was not easy for me. But I realized that I was not being there for that cast. I wasn't being there for Tony. And I wanted her and everybody to understand that because of the shifts that I've been going through with my moods and my mental health, that I didn't think it was right to leave them in the lurch anymore. So after talking with Tony, I made it official. I will no longer be a co-host, permanent co-host. Hopefully we'll get to a point where I can guest spot every once in a while or visit and stuff. But with all the stuff that I have planned for the new year, I think it would be fair to leave them hanging, wondering when or if I was coming back, especially since I'm serious about getting my book launched. I'm serious about working on book two and animation projects and keeping these um, casts going. So it was painful to finally come to the realization that I couldn't do it, but she was understanding and hopefully the Snatch and Edges podcast continues on. They have a great fan base. I know people love listening to them. And like I said, it was amazing being a part of Glamtron. But I feel like my time with that cast has to um, be done. And nothing's ever easy. But 2020 has told me, taught me actually, that I have to keep moving forward. And sometimes when you move forward, you realize that you have to keep it going, whether or not you're doing it with others or whether or not you're doing it with yourself. Right now, I'm with my partner, Axiom. We are working on so many different things. And that is where I'm going to put a lot of my creative effort and focus in for the new year. And like I said, I have a lot of plans going on into the future. A lot has to do with keeping up with politics. I was at the Onward Together meeting yesterday, and it was amazing getting to hear Hillary and so many amazing speakers talk about plans for the future, about what's being done, what has been done. It gives me hope that we will get it together. But we have an issue within our party that a lot of people are still not speaking loud enough on. But we are starting to see a bit of karma. We're starting to see people give pushback. We're starting to see things like people um, telling these young ladies that, you know, you're not passing laws. You're not really getting stuff done. So why are you here? Ellen Omar learned the hard way when she went up against Mark Warner in the interview, and he shut her down. And then she tried to whine and play the victim. But if you're not doing the work, how dare you criticize somebody who actually is? And AOC, who had a committee job that was pretty much in the bag because of where she was, given to another person overwhelmingly over her because she's too busy being an influencer instead of a representative. And I know that it's angering St. Bernicus, the patron saint of self-promotion, that his little agents of chaos aren't getting the sway he thought he could get for them. But people are tired of those who don't do, especially after four years of Trump. We cannot afford to have people in our Congress as representatives too busy enriching themselves overdoing for their constituents and beyond. We have plenty of new-blooded reps who are doing the job. Lauren Underwood just got promoted to uh, a committee position. I am sure that Sharice Davis and so many other junior congresswomen will succeed and help shape our future politics. So all these show ponies and show voters are wasting their time if they think that they're going to keep running their mouths on Twitter, having feuds with actual Democrats who they want to label established, and see no fallout from it. Like I said, that might have worked for the malware messiah. He got a 40-year gig, three houses, and millions of dollars buying and selling his own book. But it's not going to work in the digital age. We are able to call this stuff out, and I will continue to call this stuff out. And like I said, I am hoping that we have somebody who could primary uh, Rashida Tlaib here, because if not, I'm going to jump into politics, because I am sick of the squad at this point. I'm sick of them hiding behind being women of color, 
when they do nothing to further the gains for women of color or men of color. And all they do is run off their mouths by racism in the case of, well, anti-Semitism, which is akin to bigotry anyway, in the case of Representative Tlaib. They seem to have a problem with the Democratic Party, but no problem taking the platform, the money, the backing for it. And they are just a drop in the bucket of the drifters that give me a headache. We've got Nina Turner. Now, I may or may not run that ridiculous 90s looking ad she ran to announce her running for Congress. But it's real funny that she's running as a Democrat when she's had nothing but smoke for the party and party members these last couple of years. And last I checked, she was with Proud Grifter going to run a People's Party with Susan Sarandon and a bunch of other Bernie Whack jobs. But creating a party isn't easy. Getting the backing, really doing the work, no, nah, they don't want to do stuff like that. They want to take the Democratic Party and shape it into a bunch of promises that can't be fulfilled while they enrich themselves. And if you follow the money trail of Ms. Turner... You're not going to like what you find. So I caution those who think that you need to vote for her as a step towards progress when Chantel Brown, who I just started following on Twitter, has no ties to any nefarious money. And she is an earnest Democratic nominee who just wants to represent the citizens of Ohio. So... Nina Turner might have all the flash and bang and Bernie bros trying to back her. But in the end, we need people who are going to get the work done. And she is a grifter along with Sean King, who I would love to see in 2021 just get completely trounced in their attempts to jump into politics because they don't care about actual politics. It's not about helping people. It's about making sure they get theirs. And I'm sick and tired of people amplifying her. I'm sick of people amplifying him. I am tired of people who talk a good game, but have nothing to back them. And Nina does not have many wins under her belt. So I'm not really worried if Chantel really runs a strategic uh, run against her. I think she will get the nomination, but she's very loud and loud people tend to get on her attention still. And we need to tune out her noise because she was there while her best buddy, hey, it's Morelli. Um, we're talking about Nina Turner, oh, queen of the five heads. She gets on my nerves. She tends to talk the talk of progression, but just like Bernie Sanders, it's all talk. And there's been notable ties to her being back by foreign influencers who give her money. And we can't afford that anymore. We have four years of that. And I'm not going to back somebody who claims to be progressive, but has nothing under their belts for it, and only wants to attack the party that she wants to run under. You call yourself a Democrat, but every word out of your mouth is an attack on the party. You said yourself that you were going to form a people's party. Why aren't you doing that, Nina? Why are you still using our platform and resources to run? And some people will go, oh, she wants to make the party better. How? Nothing she's pushing for, nothing she has ever tried to throw her hat in has been to make the party all around better. And we have to stop amplifying these clowns to yell, oh, Medicare for all will be the savior of everything, and class warfare or fighting systemic racism. And that's why I want to get on gatekeepers, because we have far too many people who try that nonsense. Case in point, this cat. I'm going to hopefully show this display properly. I couldn't believe it when I seen it. Let me make sure it comes up, because it was just amazingly dumb. Um, I don't know if you can see old Bean here, but his tweet reads, One of the interesting things here is that white liberals are actually more progressive on race than black voters. I had this conversation twice with black folks while working in factories of 
Wisconsin, because that state's known for all the black diversity. The structural issues versus individual and community responsibility. This guy was full of shit. And I could not hold it in. I decided to respond to him in the video on my Twitter because he is just a drop in the bucket. He was quoting something that Chris Hayes and some other guy mansplaining about race relations. But he fixed... What the heck? Okay. It is that thing on Lizzo. I am going to get out of that. I can talk about the whole Lizzo thing without having to um, actually uh, deal with this weird thing popping up. Let me see if I just scroll down here. It's not letting me exit out. Either way, the thing that pisses me off about gatekeepers like this, and I call them gatekeepers even though there's no gate to keep, is they have convinced themselves fully that they're more progressive. They center themselves on every topic. And for a white man who's probably never in his life dealt with any of the racism that I've lived with my entire 43 years on this planet, can be more knowledgeable about race relations and progressive because he talked to two black co-workers in a factory in Wisconsin who probably just wanted him to get out of their, his, their faces. The dude looked like every neckbeard, hipster wannabe, flannel wearing, dual flag emojis in his Twitter profile and blocked anybody who dared question his authority on race. And yeah, I'm pretty sure there's more black people in your apartment complex as well. I couldn't believe that nonsense. He thought talking to two black people in a factory in Wisconsin made white people more progressive on race relations than the people who deal with racism every damn day of our lives. And it just got me thinking about how many people think like that. It's like the dudes who have to come and mansplain women's issues to us online who when we're talking about things like reproductive rights or personal stories, like when I talked about getting away from my abusive ex, you always have these dudes that have to jump into your mentions that either not all or explain how, you know, the psychological thing of this and, oh, there's no such thing as uh, toxic uh, uh, masculinity. And it's like, yeah, there is. When a man can't be his true self because it's called, they're told to man up, when they're told that the only way to be masculine is to be tough and hard and stuff, when you drive boys to act a certain way and get away with it because that's their nature, that's all a part of toxic masculinity. And way too many of you want to mansplain away while, because supposedly you don't act like that, it can't be all men. Enough of you. Just like I tell people who try to say, not all white people. Enough of you. So all that energy you're wasting to defend the ones that supposedly aren't, you should be working on talking to your ancestors about their issues. Because their issues are affecting people like me and beyond who don't fit that cis, straight, white Christian uh perfect package that you want to portray as real Americans. Real Americans are diverse. Real Americans come from every walk of life. We come from every different system. And we're getting pretty sick and tired of you trying to gatekeep who's American at this point. We have a new president and vice president who reflects so much of what this country is. She is a black woman. She is also a Southeast Asian woman. She is a child of immigrants from Jamaica. She is everything so many of us can relate to. And it's about damn time we have to stop having a government like this. Because the GOP would love us to believe that our government can only be led by straight white old men who have no idea how life really works because they've been spoon-fed through a system that pats them on the back for any mediocre thing they do. It is time for the people who know how to survive in this country to take charge and make things better 
for everybody. And I've been saying that for years. And we need doers, not just talkers. There are way too many people who like to talk the game, play games, but don't want to actually do the work to get stuff done. And it is going to be rough. I am so worried about people right now because our government is currently leading towards that shutdown, like I said in the beginning. And it's because we have people still in control who only want to enrich themselves. We, there is no reason besides selfish greed and grifting that the American people are the only citizens who didn't have a comprehensive COVID plan to help us and keep the economy stimulated. Say we have a bunch of morons currently still governing us until January. And they didn't care if people suffered. They didn't care if we got sick and died. We are over 300,000 deaths due to this virus. It didn't have to be like this. We have people being evicted. We have people struggling in food lines. It didn't have to be like this. And these idiots would rather argue to protect companies like Tyson and Walmart and other companies that put their employees' lives in danger over giving a stimulus package that will give people money so that they can pay bills for these next few weeks. And they're trying to scorch earth everything so that the new administration has more problems on their shoulders. And they're not fooling anybody because they bank on Americans being dumb enough to get mad at the Biden administration for not doing enough. And sadly, that might be an issue because we already have idiots on Twitter talking about, well, what is Biden going to do? Nothing. He's a private citizen until January 21st. So there's not much he can do, <coughs> excuse me, outside building his administration from the ground up. Unlike some morons, he actually wants to get people who can get the job done. And I noticed that the more diverse his uh, picks are, the more people are arguing over it. Oh, this person isn't progressive enough. You mean this person isn't loud and wrong enough? Deb Howland, I, I, I don't want to mess up her name, first Native American woman to be put on the environmental committee. Of, oh, oh no, is she environmental? I got to get all the list of committees. I will have that for the end of the year thing. But he has picked some of the most diverse people for this. Women, men who have worked their asses off to make strides in their field that will head things like um, environmental protections, uh, transportation, which... I don't know about you, but I love that people together got that domination. It is a big in your face to people who don't understand that Democrats can work together, even if they're rivals. They don't have to be all nasty and knife in the back. And there's just so much potential for his future. I said it a few weeks ago, and I mean it. I could see him one day in the White House as president if he takes the time to learn what he needs to learn and his cabinet position puts him in that path to doing that. And I do believe that Pete learned a lot from his run. I think he needed to learn that you have to be past yourself if you want to be successful in politics. You have to think beyond what only affects you. And you have to realize that you can't just put it down to your Midwest values versus everybody else. You have to be open to working with people even if you don't understand them. And that's a problem that a lot of these so-called progressive grifters, as I like to call them, have. They seem to think that there's no wiggle room. There's no way to compromise. It's their way or the highway. And considering you don't even want to pave your highway, nobody's paying you no mind anyway. I honestly hope that we get somebody really centered on not only stimulating the economy, but focused on undoing the damage Mnuchin did, passing out loans to people who did not deserve it, like Joe Osteen and Mitch McConnell's wife, Elaine Cho, and we can get stuff fixed, but it's not going to be easy. That stimulus bill was hard enough to pass with Mitch McConnell in play. But we also have to remember that in 2017, the GOP tax scam gave a bunch of people who didn't need a tax break a break that will be covering for years, if not beyond. There's a lot of mess to clean up, and it's going to be on 
a lot of us who have the ability to speak up against it to remind people of all the work that the new administration has to get done. Because a lot of people don't understand politics. They want instant gratification. And that is just not how life works. Especially after four years of fuckery. And speaking of fuckery, I love how the GOP goes on a freaking crusade over being called fuckers. When all they've done is engage in fuckery. They want to whine about voter uh, voter irregularities when they're the ones caught cheating. They want to talk about morality when most of them are constantly caught with their pants down, their, their asses in full-on trouble doing stuff they're not supposed to do. So they're whining about this woman who called them fuckers being a Biden appointee, and it's like, where's the lot? Use our fuckers. And this, if anything, this held up stimulus package is more proof that you are fuckers. You need to understand that in the digital age, this ain't your daddy's uh, nonsense. You're not going to have the newspapers uh, shine you up to be these great people when we know better. The age of social media calling you cats out. And I think that the Republican Party is going to be surprised just how many people are not buying their bullshit no more. You might have those supposed never-Trumpers. Those people are in a cult for Donald Trump. They aren't exactly um, swayed for the Republican Party. And they're going to find that out in the Georgia runoffs pretty soon. Because it goes whatever that demented dummy says. And if he says, you know what, I don't think that Lofner Chick or that Purdue guy is loyal enough to me, those idiots will stay home. And this is the stuff that you unleashed on your party. Just like the Romans with Caligula. You thought you could handle the motherfucker, and he ended up burning you. And I am happy for it, because you should have learned from history. I'm telling you, though, as much as I praise social media for calling people out, it also has its toxic side, and that is another part of gatekeeping, and yes, definitely, Gandhi, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a chicken, it is ridiculous, it's hard to see just how ridiculous it is with our politics, but I'm glad we live in the age where we can see this nonsense, because Back in the day, especially when I was younger and the regular administration and both of the Bush administrations were in charge, we didn't get a lot of people being able to talk openly about the stuff they got away with. And the thing that pissed me off the most is how they venerated Ronald Reagan when, when I was growing up, people lived in cars. New York City was a hellhole. I do not say that lightly, but there were places you could not go in my hometown unless you wanted to be raped, wanted to be robbed. I was attacked as a child because of where I lived. It was not a good time. And we had a president that cared more about trading weapons and seeming like a good old cowboy than actually doing what he needed to do to help American citizens. I lived with the mass graves the first time with the AIDS crisis. I didn't think I was going to live and uh, long enough to see a day where they had to use that island again for mass graves. But I got family members buried in those mass graves because of Trump's handling the COVID. And it reminds me, point blank, why I could never be conservative. The stuff I've lived through under conservative presidents would twist anybody. And I just don't understand how in this digital age they think they can continue to get away with their stuff and continue to push the lies that these men were heroes when we know that they were anything but. And I see friends of mine sharing stories about how they had to live in shared houses because it wasn't safe for them. They were being murdered for being gay and lesbian and transgender. When I know that we still have transgender murders and people are trying to downplay them or, or spread turf lies, there's just so much to do and so many people that need us to back them and help them. And I will never, ever support anybody who is against real progress that helps elevate all of us and pushes for equality. And that is a problem I see with a lot of gatekeepers on social media right now. 
that try to push that. Oh, I'm progressive, but uh, we need to establish what real uh, biology is, and uh, this makes you male or this makes you female. Get out my face with that nonsense. If you're a turf, I don't fuck with you. If you're a hardline conservative, I ain't fucking with you because you seem to think that your morality and rigid standards are more important than the lives of people who don't look like you, think like you, and act like you. And I ain't got time for people like you in my life. I'm not joking anymore with this because I've seen how cruel these people can be, especially these last four years. And I don't want no parts of it. I want to make this world better despite them. Sure, they'll bitch and complain that the good old days were better, which it really wasn't. But we need to keep moving forward with or without them. And even if they benefit from it, I want to make it better for people like me and people who aren't like me. Because that's what this world should be about. It shouldn't be about just helping people that look like me only. It shouldn't be about just helping a certain fraction of people. We all need to benefit because this world is not getting any better. And the toxicity of our species is going to harm harm us all if we don't start making the necessary changes. I work on myself every day. I am working on my health constantly. I know some people have been complimented. I know some people are uh, nervous about that, but don't be. I announced months ago that I started exercising because I noticed that my health was really going down in a spiral. When I first moved up here to Michigan, I moved into an area where not only are we using a shared mailbox, but we have a communal dumpster. So I have to do things like walk my own trash, get the mail. I don't do it much right now because of COVID. I have become a little shut in because I don't want to get sick. And the people around here in my state don't seem to want to mask up or act like COVID's a real issue. So I pretty much stay in unless Axiom comes down and we go for a ride or something. I do not want to risk my health. But I used to walk every day. If it wasn't to get the mail, it was to take the trash out. And I noticed, especially this year, it was hard. I'm not even going to front. If I wasn't breaking down in sweat, I was in pain. And I knew because I gained a shit ton of weight. And I've always been a big woman. I'm not going to act like I was ever, like, truly skinny. The one time I lost a ton of weight when I was a teenager, I was miserable. My family put me on a crash bad diet. And sure, I was really thin. My aunt literally carries a picture around of it because that's just their mentality. I've learned in a black and Asian family that you just deal with those aunties that They they have this ideal standard for what's perfection with women. And my aunt literally carries a picture of me real thin, thinking that that's the way I would be happy, even though in that picture I was miserable. She didn't even notice it. She was just so fixated on the fact that I was skinny in that picture that it didn't matter to her. So I say this. I am not exercising to get skinny. That's not really my goal. I'm exercising to get back to the point where I was in Durham, where I could walk, I could run, I felt good. Yeah, I was thick, but it felt cute thick. It didn't feel unhealthy, and it wasn't causing me pain. I'm in my 40s now. I cannot afford to have too much weight on my system. I am only 5'3", so it is hard on your joints when you have a bit too much excess. So I decided to start riding. And I noticed that a lot of people, thank you, sweetie. And Reagan did cut taxes on the rich. He was another. That trickle-down system pisses me off. But I, I, I noticed that a lot of people started getting healthier. And they got backlash for it. Adele, which some people tried to say, oh, no, people praise her. No, a lot of people jumped on Adele for losing a bunch of weight, saying she looked sickly. The body positivity movement got mad at her for it. Then Lizzo, who did a juice cleanse, which was one of the articles that had popped up, but that weird ad nonsense kept popping up, and I don't want that noise. But a lot of people took to Twitter talking about how disappointed they were in her and how dangerous it's a slippery slope, and I get it. I was put on those stupid crash diets as a teenager. I don't fuck with those no more. 
I realize that you can't drink your way to a successful weight loss. It is a, a mentality that comes with a routine of exercise and eating a bit better. I like food. I make a lot of my own food. I make a lot of food that comes from Southern tradition, a lot of food that comes from my Filipino family. I make food, but I realize that I can substitute certain things. I can portion better, and I don't have to eat out so much, and I've been working out the last almost three months now, and I notice a lot of visible changes, including not so much body pain. I still get the morning joy pains, but I'm getting old, so it happens. But I have slimmed down in the face. I'm starting to notice that my gut is starting to finally go down. I feel a lot better. But a lot of people who want to be body positive, which I don't understand how you talk about body positive if people don't feel good. If I'm losing weight because I need to feel good, how is that not body positive? I'm not telling big girls who actually can get it and are healthy that they can't do that. And I made a video talking about how for somebody who has struggled between sizes on my life, I've been lucky. I've never had heart issues. I do not have high cholesterol. I do not suffer from a lot of things that most people attribute to obesity. I'm not even in the line for diabetes, and they test me all the time because a lot of doctors want to find that in me. And they're always amazed that they don't. I'm not heavy on sugary stuff. I don't eat a lot of bread anymore. I stopped doing that years ago, and I don't drink soda. So a lot of people, they get amazed. They take my blood, and they're like, oh, well, we're going to see if you're even in the range for diabetic. And the most they've ever found with me is I suffer from anemia, which being A negative, I don't know if that has a lot to do with it or not, but I've had it since I was little. And a lot of it came from heavy um, menstruation and things like that. So that is the worst thing I've had to deal with all my life is anemia. I do not have a lot of the issues because I go through fluxes. I've gone through phases where I've been a complete health nut. I've always tried to stay active. When I lived in Durham, I didn't have a car, so we walked everywhere, you know? And here, now that I have my stationary recumbent bike, five days a week, that's all I do. I take Fridays and Saturdays off unless I have to change up a day. But five days a week, I devote 20 to 30 minutes to just putting in music, exercising, and then I'm done for the day. And it's paying off. And I know it's hard. There are days, especially this cold-ass state, where I have to motivate myself to do it. But I get it done because I know that the results can happen. When I started walking in Durham, I did it five days a week. Monday through Friday, I drop my son off to school, I take a walk up the hill, I walk around the neighborhood, I go home and I rest. Saturday and Sunday, that was my rest time. It worked out. So I just say this to you. If you're in a good place with yourself body-wise, don't feel like you need to do this. But if you're hurting and you think that you can't, baby steps are okay. And if you can't get your hands on a bike, because right now, it's hard. People don't have the money for this. I used to do yoga on my floor. I used to do just different things I could to keep active. And that's what I'm going to incorporate once I can get back up off the floor. Because like I said, even though I am starting to have visible weight loss and I'm starting to get the results, there's still some things I can't do because I'm a big girl. And... Getting down on the floor and get back up, I don't like hearing the popping noises that I make. So I'm not trying to hurt myself when all I got to do is keep doing my biking exercises. And like I said, it helps me not just physically, but mentally it keeps me focused. I have a set schedule every day that I adhere to with my son and myself, and it helps keep me through this season, which normally is the worst for me mood-wise. Not only am I everywhere mood-wise, but I tend to get full-on depressed. And I notice that, for now, I'm balanced. I'm not really happy, but I'm not sad either. And I'll take that, you know, because last year, especially after dealing with all the stuff with my mom, 
I was miserable. She had just moved out, but I was still feeling the effects of four years of her stuff. So when I finally got that freedom, I still didn't feel free. This is the first Christmas I'm having where I don't feel under pressure by people who actively tried to make my life miserable. And I think that helped too. But yeah, the backlash, uh, it, it really does feel that way, uh, Tux. It, it does. It feels like a lot of people, they, they start feeling like their fingers being pointed at them. And I need people to understand that nobody can dictate your weight loss journey. I have tried and failed several times. I had bariatric surgery in 2008. And yeah, I initially lost a lot of weight from it. But because I didn't get help psychologically, the weight came back. Because when I get stressed, I go to the one thing that I can rely on to help me calm down. And that's food. And I know some people turn up their nose at words like food addiction. And you don't understand that when you're stressed out and you can put something in your mouth to keep you calm, a lot of people do that. And it isn't healthy, but it is what it is. And it helped me understand other people who drink to get away from things or do hard drugs to get away from things. I realized that it is not an easy journey. And I am not doing my weight loss thing to inspire people. And I try to tell people that, especially when they get in my DMs, I'm like, oh, you're inspiring me to do this. Don't. Don't don't use me as your inspiration. You have to be the one to want to do this. And it is, like I said, not easy. I negotiate with myself almost every other day. Because there are some days I wake up and I'm like, I really don't want to do this. I know I need to, I know I should, but I really don't want to do it. And I do it at different times of the day, depending on how long it takes me to motivate my hard-headed ass to get on the bike to ride. But I realize that it's what I need to do. And I'm not doing it to inspire people. And I know that a lot of people, I guess they need that, but it shouldn't matter. Your weight loss journey, just like everything else in your life, is your personal path. And you're going to have days where you just are like, F it, I don't want to do this. And I don't want you feeling bad because I'm stubborn as a mule and I realize that I just want to get it done because it's only freaking five days. You know, I'm just like that. Axiom can attest. When I set a schedule, I, it bothers me. If I don't stick to that schedule, I don't know what it is about my personality. Maybe it, it explains some of why kiddo is the way he is with his, his autism. I don't know. But once I set something in place, I do it. And until so I figure that it's not benefiting me or I just don't want to do it anymore or like what happened to me in Durham right before we moved. I got inundated with people constantly coming over and draining me, so I just shut myself in. I didn't go out for walks anymore. I didn't interact with people. I was just tired. And when I got up here, because of all the stuff I went through in Durham, I completely shut it. And this year alone, I mean, it's a no-brainer. You know, I, I am a high-risk for COVID. So I just did not want that to come in. And it affects you, especially when you're used to being a bit more active. You start, it starts taking its tolls. And then I bake a lot. I cook a lot. And I'm used to making for a big family. And I had to learn to portion down because I was cooking like I was still cooking for a whole house full of people. And I realized that there's a lot of steps that I could make to change things without it feeling like a punishment. Because that's a lot of reasons why I feel personally I failed in weight loss before, too. Because I was feeling like I was punishing myself, denying myself things that make me uh, happy, denying myself things that taste good. And that don't work for people like me. If I feel like I'm denying, then I start feeling like I got to sneak. And when you start sneaking, you start giving up. I don't want to fail at this, so I do things in moderation. I still have my snacks. 
I don't have to eat them every night. I don't have to eat a whole bunch of them, but I still have them. I also keep active, but that works for me. I'm lucky enough to where it's been working that way. And sure, if I cut out a little bit more, I could probably lose faster, but that's not the point. The point is to have a sustainable system that works to keep me at a balanced weight. And I want people to understand that even that is something that I found works for me. You have to find what works for you. And you have to find what goal you want to set. Because like I told people, I'm not doing this to be skinny. The last time I was technically what one would call skinny, it was the most miserable time in my life. I felt pressured into it. I felt like I was doing it for my family and I had to look a certain way. And I realized that that's not for me. I had no problem being thicker, as I like to call it. I have no problem having hips, having curves, having a bit of a gut. I just want to get to the point where I can get up and down off the floor again. And I don't think there's any shame in that. And I think too many people, especially when they become fans of somebody or they start following somebody, you put yourself and live vicariously through them. And you get disappointed that they don't live up to this crazy standard that you set for them. That's why I always get leery when people say things like, oh, you're a saint, you're an angel. Oh, no, I'm not. And I'm always the first to say it. You don't live with me. You don't get to see the attitude I get. You don't get to see the manic mood. So, you know, you see what I uh, put out there on Twitter. You know, and sometimes I rant and sometimes I do, like when I do these Bonnet Chronicles, I try to be frank, but I don't put myself out there as like I'm better than people and I don't put myself out there as, as being the same. I'm just me. And I, I tell you all the time, don't put me on the pedestal. I might not be as bad as I was 20 years ago with some of the nonsense I used to say and do and believe. And I realize now that I like learning things and I don't know everything, so I'm not going to act like I do. But, you know, that came from taking a lot of hard knocks in life. I used to be a fucking smartass. I'm not even going to lie about it. I thought because of the education that I was able to get and the lifestyle that I was afforded because of my grandparents that... I was just better than I was. And honestly, I'm glad that life gave me a few hard knocks. Some of them I didn't deserve, but some of them I did. And it taught me a lot of life lessons to shape the crazy lady that you're watching today. And I don't want people to have to go through what I went through to realize certain things that don't matter and certain things that do. I think that everybody has to figure out what they want to do with this life and that the older you get and the closer you get to the inevitability of your life ending, you realize what matters and what's important. And I realize that my health matters because I have so much in the future that I have to look forward to. My son is going to be 16 next year. It's a milestone. He's two years away from being an adult. And hopefully going off on the life that he can be happy on. I have a partner that I love that eventually will convince me to take that plunge. You know, we're not there yet, but we're getting closer. There's a chance for potential future Kalaris running around. Who knows? There's just so much that I want to do before I take my final breath on this crazy globe. And I realize that I can't do that unless I start making some changes. And, you know, I don't want people feeling pressure because I finally came to that realization. And I feel like a lot of people who push body positivity tend to feel like they have to be under pressure. And it's called body positivity. And if you were truly positive about your body, nobody could say something to make you feel insecure. Nobody could make you feel bad for being who you are. But it's a lie that we tell ourselves that we're being body positive when we take pictures and we're big and we um, want to act like we don't care if we're going to turn around and let bullies dictate our work. You know, 
Don't lie to yourself if you're not truly feeling positive. Work on feeling good on the inside as well as the outside, and it won't matter what a celebrity or a person you admire does to work on their happiness. If you're truly a happy person, it doesn't matter what a person is doing to improve themselves. And a lot of this that I've seen on social media has shown me there are a lot of unhappy people wearing masks, faking the front, and acting like they're positive about their size when they really aren't. And you need to come to that realization sooner than later because you're just harming the image that you want to portray. I don't want people taking the body positive image and ruining it. Because there are a lot of girls who, like me, as a teen, struggle to just be who they are. And they need a movement that will support them. They need a movement that will tell them, yeah, girl, you look fine as you are. Or if you want to enhance yourself, you're fine doing that. We need to get off telling women, especially right now, how they can be hotter or look better or do this or that. We need to be more encouraging for all human beings, actually. But women especially are judged by such ridiculous critical standards. And I was supportive of the body positivity movement because I thought it was better than that. But I am seeing, just like every other very loud vocal thing, that we're not there yet because there are a lot of fakers within the movement who really aren't good with themselves. And why are you rubbing your hands together evilly? You stop that. I've already realized that we're going to move on to that point. You don't have to trigger my flight or flight, (laughs) ma'am. But yeah, I just think that people need to be wary of fake in the front. But we got eight minutes left, and I want to talk about this young man up here in the corner. His name is Eric Brown Jr., and he was arrested, he's a Mississippi man, for hacking into the Hines County Human Services Department, approving all the food stamp applications, and cards mailed out to all the new applicants totaling $2,500 apiece, and giving them $2,500 in cash credit. Now, he's currently set at a $100,000 bond. He is a modern-day Robin Hood. And now, I know some people like, Kalari, you should be on the side of criminality. That's bad. Yeah. No. During COVID, a lot of people had to go on food assistance. I am currently on food assistance. I'm not ashamed of that. I have a teenage son. And if you're not a parent and don't understand how much teenagers can ingest food-wise, you're lucky. Ask him to back me up on this. The boy can eat. I don't know where he puts it because he's not really that big of a kid, but he can eat. And when I realized that money was not coming in the way I needed it to, and please, this is not a ploy for more money. You just donated enough. Give to people who need I am good. But getting back to it, when it comes down to feeding my son, I would move heaven and earth, and I qualify for him only because of stuff going on with my ex and him not paying child support, which I don't understand how that has anything to do with me. I fled an abusive situation, but I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent. I realized that I could get a little bit of money each month to feed him so I get that money. I'm not ashamed of that. I would never be ashamed of getting state assistance to put food in my refrigerator to make sure that my child eats. And that is what it goes to. And a lot of Americans are in this boat. And a lot of states do not make it easy for people to get onset benefits. Like I said, I'd probably be able to get much more if they weren't penalizing me for not knowing where the person who was making my life miserable for years is living. I don't keep track of my ex. I don't even know, well, according to a Facebook message he sent months ago, he's still alive. But I'm hoping that that has changed in these last couple of months. That's how bad it was. So me being penalized and not being able to qualify myself, I don't care. I use what I can get from my son 
And once he's old enough to be out of the house, I probably won't get it anymore. And I'm fine with that. But I'm not going to be shamed, and I'm not going to let people shame others for doing what they have to do to eat. Because if you don't, your body needs it. And I'm not going to have my son suffer because I have rent to pay, I have utilities to keep up, and I have to make sure that he has clothes and everything else. So that extra hundred something a month, and trust me, it's all I get is a couple of hundred, not even... Two, I think the latest I get to qualify now for him is $174. And I make that stretch throughout the entire month. So you got to understand, people, that this is not some great handout people are getting. Most families can barely qualify. So this young man probably gave people Christmas and beyond doing what he did. And a lot of people are saying, did you set up a GoFundMe? Are they going to bail him out? And I know he's probably going to do some jail time, but we are in such desperate times that people are having to do stuff like this. And this is why it is so important to stop backing people who aren't willing to do the work. It all comes back full circle. We need people who are going to get the job done. They don't have to be famous. They don't have to be rock stars. They have to be willing to get the job done because we are in a time right now where if we do not undo at least some of the damage of these last four years, we are going to be in the same boat with the GOP finding somebody who can look the part and then do even more damage to not only our economic stability, but all the civil rights things that are constantly in jeopardy now that they have the Senate majority, and the Supreme Court majority. We have to be vigilant, and we have to be willing to vote for people who are willing to do the work. It is our future and our kids' future, and even beyond that, that depend on us keeping informed, not being swayed by slogans, and voting for people who really want to get things done. They aren't looking to make the cover of Vanity Fair. They don't care if their names are in the newspaper because they came to get the job done. And I know in the day and age where everybody's look at me and I've got to show off and i got to let people know that I'm living a life that we have a lot more people that are in the flash over substance, but we individually don't have to be like that. We can stay informed. We can vote for people who are going to get the job done. And we can run if we feel we can do this. And if you're watching, you don't think that you can. There are plenty of groups that are mentoring people. We have higher heights that are mentoring women of color, especially black women who want to get into politics. We have Onward Together, which is run by Hillary Clinton. And, and like I said earlier in the um, cast, I got to go to the annual Zoom me and, and it was amazing hearing her talk, hearing plans for 2021 and beyond. And I'm with her that I am going to be celebrating New Year's twice as well. First on New Year's Day and secondly on January 20th because we will finally be coming out of this four-year nightmare. And we have so much work to do. And if you feel that spark that you want to make change, and you want to run for something, but you don't know what, look at your local elections. One of the things I noticed filling out my absentee ballot was there are a lot of unchallenged local seats that can make a difference. You might not think being on the school board makes a difference, but it does. Budgets that can help our kids, help teachers are on that initiative. Being a county clerk can help with the voter issues where getting ballots processed faster. There's so much we can do as individuals to make things better and beyond, but it takes that personal investment, just like everything else in life. And if you feel like you want to do something, do it. I'm taking 2021 by its talents. I am going to be writing up a storm. I'm going to be content creating up a storm. I'm going to be promoting the heck out of Axiom's channel. I feel the energy 
that I need to channel into things. And I'm going to stay on politics, whether it's using this platform or probably running. There is going to be so much that I plan to do to help enact political and social change because I believe that this system can be better. But I believe you have to do the work to make it better. And yet... And you talk about his mugshot because he really did smile in it. And I don't blame him. But it's after 8, y'all. And yeah, I am smiling. I recommend the um, guy who is the modern day Wava Hood. But yeah, I really do feel good. I am happy and exciting, excited. And I will definitely see you next week on Saturday, the day after Christmas. And after th- that, the... Saturday after that as well, after New Year's. But next Saturday will be the end of the year Bonnet Chronicles special. And I am sure I will have a lot to talk about. We will go over all the things that happened in the year, all the triumphs and the tragedies, and hopefully, you know, just share what we're looking forward to in 2021. I know I shared a bit of it tonight, but there is just so much more. And thank you all for tuning in. I'm going to wrap it up and then go pester Axie. I'll see you later.